Nagato is an interesting character. Like all Naruto villains, he seems to just be a poor kid that lost his way and gave in to the shinobi world's cruelty and was changed by it. Nagato wasn't always special. He became known as the third Sage of Six Paths, but let's be honest, this wasn't because he was anything special. His Rinnegan were alone from Madara, and the poor boy couldn't even use them to their full potential. But despite that, he still leveled Konoha like a boot squashing a bug, and was only taken out because Naruto is the hero. But Nagato's fall to the dark side really was started by the death of Yahiko, the man he looked up to the most. But Yahiko didn't ever truly have to die. This was a selfless choice he made, and he used Nagato as a vector for that to hopefully satiate Hanzo's cravings for cruelty. So let's just take a moment to think about what might have happened had Yahiko, for some reason, not been killed on that day. Welcome to the Amagi. In today's video, we're going to view a world where Yahiko survived his original death. Before we begin, only 25% of our viewers are subscribed, so if you're a fan of the video, please like and double check that you are indeed subscribed. And with that out of the way, let's get into the video. The rain was falling as it always did. The rain never let up. It always just kept pounding the ground eternally, washing away blood like some metaphor for something larger. But today, nobody gave a damn about metaphors. Right now, they were in the middle of bloodshed, or perhaps caught just before bloodshed. Looking up at him on his perch high above, Nagato and Yahiko watched as Hanzo held Conan by the throat. Conan would normally dodge these things. Her paper-style jutsu made it hard to ever pin her down, but this was unexpected. After all, Hanzo had never been their enemy. In fact, he was their idol. And now that she was caught, there was nothing that could be done. It would take too long for her to reduce her body to paper and escape. No, the moment she made even a little movement, Hanzo would kill her. This was also true for Yahiko and Nagato. There was no way to save her. They tried a lot of things, begging, pleading, stroking his ego, confessing their admiration. Nothing really seemed to change the old legend's mind. He didn't really seem all too interested in their platitudes as they attempted to explain their noble goals and desires. Really, all they truly were to him was a threat, and he had already determined in his own mind that they all would die. The only question now was how? What way would be most pleasurable? What would make them hurt the most and really drive home the fear? How could he make them feel that every terror and bad expectation that they could possibly have undersold the reality of what they were facing? He thought about it. Ritualistic suicide is what his mind settled on. Oh, how beautiful. The concept that by sacrificing one's life, all others would be saved. And what's better than that, he would make the other do it. Yahiko was their leader, so he should be the first to die, and he should do it by the hands of his friend. That's what he told them. He told them that Yahiko should die. Hurry up, or do you want this woman to die? He shouted to them. Yahiko turned to him and told him simply that he should kill him. Nagato was confused as to why the one man they respected the most, even above Jiraiya, was going to make them kill each other just because they were helping him protect his village. Nagato reached down and picked up a kunai. He looked at the iron blade there was nothing special about it. It was not designed to be made of anything that could never rust. These were designed to be disposable, just like them. The Akatsuki were now disposable to Hanzo, and right now Hanzo was disposing of them like a used kunai. He looked over. Yahiko! Suddenly, Yahiko rushed him and pushed his body up against Nagato so that his friend wouldn't have the chance to refuse stabbing him. Nagato was shocked and Conan called out Yahiko's name. Yahiko lay his head on Nagato's shoulder, expectant that the blood might begin to pour from his perforated bowels, but it never came up. Yahiko looked down and realized that Nagato was holding his kunai in reverse grip. The only thing that Yahiko had touched of the kunai was its rounded loop, where one would put their finger for leverage. Nagato! Yahiko shouted out, as if angry that Nagato had somehow thwarted his attempt in a premeditated fashion. Nagato was speechless. Whatever nerve he had built up at this point was gone from the shock of the failed attempt. He stumbled back, stuttering over his own words. Hanzo looked down. Well, do it. Kill him. Nagato looked at the blade in his hand, and in terror and disgust, he discarded it. Nagato! Yahigo cried out as he saw him throw the kunai away. Hanzo rolled his eyes. Fine. Then we'll do it this way then. He drove his blade through Conan's chest, twisting the blade and sawing about with it just to make sure it hurt just to make sure that he hit the vital organs. 
Putting his foot in the small of her back, he kicked her off the blade and down the steep incline toward the ground where the body tumbled and bounced along the path before smashing into the ground. Yahiko saw this as did Nagato. Yahiko ran over toward Conan and held her up. She cried out, her bones broken from the fall. With her one good arm, she gripped out at the wound as if she could somehow stop it from bleeding. Yahiko cried out to her, Conan! She gurgled and tried to say something, but what it was, Yahiko couldn't hear. She tried once more and it almost sounded like she said, help me. She coughed as a spurt of blood ejected from her mouth. She wheezed three times before her eyes glazed and she started to fall against Yahiko. Her arms and legs twitched momentarily before all movement left her body. Her eyes remained open, but there was nobody home. No light. Yahiko had seen this before. You could stare directly into the eyes of someone like this and just know that no one was looking back. Nagato crawled over. Conan. He witnessed the husk left behind and felt as if it was his fault. But if he had killed Yahiko, what guarantee was there that any of them would survive? And if he would have still lost a friend? He had merely been given the cruel choice of deciding which of his friends would die, and today it was Conan. Nagato hated himself for his weakness and knew for certain that Yahiko would hate him for it too. He gripped his dark cloak and grit his teeth. He hated it. He hated the situation, he hated himself, but above all other things, he hated Hanzo. He looked up at him, every glance cursing his soul, every breath uttering death and pain, as if he were chanting some ancient spell that would inflict the pains of hell upon this man. Hanzo was not a hero. Hanzo was a creature. He was an animal. An animal to be hunted for sport and then wasted as if his life never mattered. And in Nagato's eyes, it never did. He so callously disposed of his best friend, and now Nagato would dispose of Hanzo like garbage, like trash, like nothing. All the while, Hanzo looked deep into the eyes of Nagato and immediately felt the killing intent. And what was worse, he felt that Nagato had the power to do it too. Even Danzo, upon seeing this, suddenly disappeared in a puff of smoke. Hanzo commanded his men to fire their kunai down at Nagato, but Nagato lifted his hand and the kunai bounced away from him, as if being struck by some invisible barrier that protected him. Nagato would then rush them, but a fire-style jutsu would cause massive damage to his legs. Despite being set ablaze, Nagato stood resolute. No pain could compare to the loss of Conan, so anything they did to his body was a pale echo. He hoped that he could teach them some semblance of pain, anything close to what he felt. His Rinnegan opened wide, so wide that they seemed almost as if they might fall out of his head, and from them a silent call went out, a whisper. From the ground, two hands shot up, pulling itself from the earth like an undead revenant pulled from death by some necromancer, the ghetto statue appeared, but it would have its toll. Chakra rods extended from the creature and buried themselves in the back of Nagato where they would then begin to siphon out his chakra. Nagato cried out, but the ghetto statue, as if it were the devil summoned up to forge a deal for his soul, began to fulfill their contract and effortlessly slaughter everyone. A chakra dragon shot out from its mouth. It passed through the air and overtook the bodies of those nearby, pulling their souls from their forms and devouring them as if it were nothing. Hanzo, seeing this, fled just as Danzo previously had, leaving his men to die. The other men fled, crying out in terror, but nothing could save them. They were fish in a barrel, and Nagato was holding the biggest shotgun in the world. Eventually, all fell quiet. The statue quit moving and Nagato just lay there, his knees hardly above the ground, his legs not even trying to stand, his entire body dangling by the rods buried in his back. Yahiko rushed over to check on him. Nagato's eyes remained open, and though there was light in them, there was no consciousness. Yahiko tried to pull Nagato from the rods, but his eyes suddenly blinked and he screamed out in pain. The rods weren't going anywhere. Realizing this, Yahiko took his blade, the tip removed in a symbolic disavowal of violence and used it to shatter the rods so that Nagato might fall into his arms. I have you, Nagato. I have you. Years later, after endless civil war, Hanzo finds himself on the ground. He looks up in horror to find the one who bested him, a woman with purple hair and Rinnegan patterned eyes. Across her body were what appeared to be various piercings, but in reality were the way in which she was remotely controlled. By her side, five other beings stood, each with their hair dyed purple, possessing the same Rinnegan markings in their eyes. Yahiko stood in the background, his gaze only out of the corner of his eye as he watched this unfold. His face's angle suggested shame, but he would not step in to help, no matter how hard Hanzo begged. No, instead he sat there and watched. 
These six figures, each one a pale imitation of the girl he had killed so many years earlier, showed him no mercy. Violently and gruesomely, they killed Hanzo. Once the deed was done, they turned to leave. Yahiko spoke. Should we at least bury him? Pain from the persona of Conan turned to look at him. He is trash. Let him fester and rot like trash. The six paths walked out of the building. Yahiko took one look at the body and then turned to follow them. In these past years, Yahiko had lost complete control of Nagato, of the Akatsuki as a whole. He had originally given over the Akatsuki to Nagato as Yahiko had blood on his hands from an accidental killing years prior. But now that blood was everywhere and Nagato was drowning in it. Years of civil war had turned a peacekeeping group into a war-waging one. They had gone from a private security force and ambassadorial group into a mercenary unit hell-bent on taking over the Hidden Rain Village, and now they had. They just had. With the head of the village removed and what little of his forces remaining scattered in the face of them, Nagato was, for better or worse, the new dictator of Amegakure. He returned to their base to see Nagato. He was a cold shell of his former self. Pale, bony, and requiring continual life support, all of which held within a mobile unit that used the same concept as a puppet. It looked like a spider that Nagato was riding. Nagato opened his eyes as Yahiko stepped in. He didn't speak or say anything. At this point, Nagato's consciousness was untethered and floating about seven different bodies. Each one could equally be considered Nagato, or maybe it was just pain now. This Darth Vader-esque fall to darkness had left Nagato unrecognizable. But deep down, he knew that the person Nagato had been was still in there somewhere, and now it was time to bring it back. The war that Yahiko reluctantly agreed to was now over, and there was no need for this weaponized form of Nagato to continue. It was time for the pain to go away, to heal with time and love, to return to Nagato. It was time to beat the swords into plowshares. Nagato, the war is officially over. What do you plan to do now? Nagato's spider walked by silently, no words or anything. He was merely walking his way towards Hanzo's tower, the highest point in all of Ame a point with which he could use his six paths across the entire village without much effort. Yahiko walked with him there and helped him get set up and comfortable. Nagato sat there and closed his eyes. Yahiko looked at him as if he thought Nagato was sleeping. Suddenly, beside him, he noticed Conan staring into the back of his head. Yahiko could never get used to this. He turned to Conan. Nagato, now that the war's over, what do you plan on doing now? Conan stood there silent for a moment before speaking. Bring peace to the rest of the world. Yahiko looked out at the partly devastated Ame. This, this isn't peace, Nagato. Nagato looked out over the site. It looks like peace to me. No fighting. There will never be fighting here ever again. Yahiko turned to look at him. That's solely because you have them in a death grip. They're scared of you. This isn't peace, this is fear. Conan's Rinnegan cut to Yahiko. What's the difference? Yahiko was startled. How can anyone enjoy this? They can enjoy it because they're still alive. And if they wish to stay that way, they ought to not sabotage this peace, else they'll know the same fate as Hanzo. Yahiko shook his head. You've been listening to that man, Madara, again. Conan's gaze looked out over the village. Madara's plans align with mine. He's controlling you, Nagato, Yahiko shouted. Despite his rise in tone and flailing of arms, Conan did not flinch, nor did her tone shift from Nagato's monotone nature. He's only in as much control as I allow him. I'm still the leader of this organization. Yahiko sighed. For how long though? The issue is, people who are under someone else's control rarely know they are until they've completely lost their own. He's going to make a move eventually and dispose of you. You're only necessary to his plans now. What happens when your usefulness comes to an end? Conan stood there, silent for a moment. Likely the same thing that will happen to him when his usefulness comes to an end. Yahiko shook his head. You truly have changed, Nagato. I've become what the world made me. My desire for peace remains. I've merely become a realist. Yahiko looked to him. And what does that mean? What does it mean for you to be a realist? Conan spoke. I realize that you and I want peace. But the reality of this world is that we're the only ones. Nobody wants peace. Have you noticed how the land of fire, wind, lightning, water, and earth fund their nations? Through their hidden villages. These villages are the heart and soul of these kingdoms. And what is one resource each village predominantly brings to the table? Shinobi. Soldiers. The economy of our world is supported by war. A war economy. Weapons manufacturers create tools for Shinobi. 
shinobi buy food and items for war, villages send shinobi to war and send them out on mercenary missions to make money. The entire world system is held up by war. Nobody wants peace because peace is linked in their minds to poverty, while war is linked to a life of plenty. And all go to war to chase their dreams. Standard shinobi wish to become kage by proving themselves. Blood has become the currency of this world, and so long as war is profitable, it will continue to be waged. Nobody wants peace, and because of that, peace will never come unless we shove it down their throats. Yahiko stood there and looked out over the village once more. He understood every word that was spoken was true, but then again, he couldn't accept that. I refuse to believe that, Nagato. I refuse to believe that people don't want peace. I've seen Shinobi fight and die, begging for it. Conan took a deep breath. It wasn't like this body needed to breathe, but this was done from habit. Perhaps not. But then again, what will simple shinobi do? They're duty-bound, bound by honor, by patriotism. The shinobi who fight the war come to learn how bad war is. They see what it looks like and hate it, searching for peace instead. But the difference is, those who initiate war, those who invite it and send the warriors out, never see it themselves. They simply do not know war. They do not know pain. And it's because of that, war will never end. War at its worst must be experienced by all for peace to become an option. I understand your reluctance, Yahiko. After all, you and I know pain. But until the world knows it, it cannot know peace. This gray area must become a well-defined line. War or peace. Nothing in between. No ceasefires. Only the peace treaty to end all peace treaties. We must indulge in the business of war to end war as a business. This is the only way. Yahiko grunted as he realized he was getting nowhere. He was unsure if he could ever change Nagato's mind on this, and since he couldn't change Nagato's mind, he would have to keep an eye out on him and possibly even sabotage him if it came down to it. What Nagato was planning to do would cause the deaths of countless people. The path to peace should not be paved with blood like this, not in Yahiko's eyes, and so he kept his eyes open. The first thing to do was to keep an eye on this Madara fellow. He was the one who spoke of the tailed beasts. He was the one who told Nagato that he could absorb them with the ghetto statue. It was obvious that he knew far more than he let on, and so he would wait until the next meeting of the Akatsuki, the next face-to-face -face meeting between him and Pain. It's time we begin operations, Pain would say. We now have the proper manpower and the proper funding to begin this project. Toby, in the guise of Madara's voice, would speak. Having tracked most of the tailed beasts to their targets, I've compiled a list of targets and which to strike first. The Jinchuriki of the Five Tails, Han of Iwagakure, is currently living on his own away from the village and should be an easy target. Payne thought about this deeply for a moment and nodded. Then he is the first target. I'll issue the order to bring Han to me, then we'll remove his Five Tails and place it within the statue. Madara nodded his head to this and turned to leave. Before he does, however, he's bumped into by Yahiko. Pardon me, Yahiko, Toby says in the voice of Madara. Yahiko holds out a hand to stop him from moving past, and suddenly the air in the room changes. Yahiko looks to Madara. What are you up to, Madara? Without even moving his head to face Yahiko, he speaks. Whatever do you mean, Yahiko? Yahiko turns his head to look straight into that orange mask. What are you doing to Nagato? What's your plan? What do you get out of this? And what happens to Nagato when you're done? Finally, Toby turns to face him. Plan? My only plan is to bring peace. I share yours and Nagato's goal. That is what I get out of it. Peace. And I do not plan to do anything to pain. He and I share a common goal. To work against him is to work against myself. At any point, Toby could have phased through Yahiko's arm, but he didn't. This was a different sort of battle entirely. By not phasing through, he was not running. He could easily show off his Kamui in an attempt to intimidate Yahiko, but nothing in his mind could be more intimidating than not phasing through because in remaining tangible, he was sending a message. A message that said he did not need to phase through Yahiko because he was not threatened by him. All the while, Yahiko kept his hand on Toby's chest, his eyes fixated on that single visible Sharingan. The long moment of silence had become a mental battle to display dominance, and the prize was Nagato. Even to a point, Pain turned to look to see what was happening between the two of them. Yahiko was keeping his eyes on Toby to counter as if saying, you don't scare me at all. 
They continued to stand like this until Pain looked to them and commanded them to break apart. Taking the order, Yahiko held his hand there for three more seconds. Each of those seconds, his eyes filled to the brim with more determination than he had displayed in the entirety of their conversation. He then removed his hand and let Toby walk on and disappear into his kamui as he tended to do when he was done speaking. Payne took a look at Yahiko, and Yahiko looked up once to meet Payne's gaze before the two of them looked away. All the while, Yahiko fought the urge to smile, knowing that he had just tagged Madara, and right now he'd be able to easily find his location. As the day wound down and Yahiko was given leave to do as he pleased, Yahiko would end up teleporting to just outside the area, where he would find himself near an abandoned mineshaft. He would ease his way in where he hoped to uncover any or all of this Madara's secrets. As he made his way deeper into the mine, he found it as just that, a mine. But as he went deeper, he found old roots. Following these roots, he would eventually find himself sneaking into a facility that seemed more for military use than the mineshaft had. Skulking about, he eventually found himself walking through a corridor of various rooms with various supplies and weapons. Then he stepped into a room. The moment his presence was detected by a sensor, the lights automatically came on. This caused Yahiko to jump ever so slightly. Seeing that there was no threat, he took a look around and realized what he was witnessing was a room filled with medical tools and walls packed from floor to ceiling with jars containing what appeared to be preserved Sharingan. Yahiko looked around at this. He had never seen a repository of dojutsu this large. He knew very little of how dojutsu worked outside of what he had learned from Nagato, but he did know one thing. Sharingan had the ability to mutate into Mangekyo Sharingan when enough stress was added, and even if a quarter of these Sharingan had the ability to become Mangekyo, given how hacks they could be from the stories he heard, this could possibly make Madara the most powerful man in the entirety of not only Konoha, but perhaps the entirety of the world. These gave him options, both militarily and politically, as Sharingan and their various uses could be used to cast Genjutsu and other mind-altering techniques on politicians and people of power. He almost wondered if it were possible that such a Genjutsu could have been cast over Nagato. That would explain his odd conviction to a plan that Yahiko viewed to be illogical. Well, illogical was a stretch, but at the very least uncharacteristic. Simply the knowledge that this was here was enough. So long as he wasn't detected, merely returning to Nagato with this knowledge might be enough to snap him out of it. He stepped out of the room, which caused the lights to go out a little while after. He continued to sneak through. He would eventually find himself in a room where there was a massive bud. It seemed as if it were closed now, but it was still alive to the best of his knowledge. The roots had all led Yahiko here to this room. He walked up to the flower and took a good look at it. Below it, there appeared to be water, and submerged in that water, he could see something. He stepped to the crevice and sniffed. He was hoping to make sure that what he was actually sniffing was really water. And once he was sure it was water, he decided to take a dip to find out what was down there. As he began to swim, he saw what appeared to be cocoons under the water. His curiosity got the better of him, so he got closer to the nearest cocoon and placed his hands on it to take a look. He had no idea what it was, but it didn't seem to be booby-trapped. So he placed his hands on the flaps and began to pull until he could open it up. Within the cocoon, he discovered, to his horror, a person. But this person did not appear to be made of the same flesh he was. No, far from it. He was made solely of some white substance that almost put him in the mind of tofu. He almost screamed and lost all of his oxygen when he saw it, but he maintained his composure. Slowly, its eyes opened and looked directly into his. Yahiko floated there as their eyes made contact. He did the only thing he could think of to do. He reached out with his hand and touched its forehead to cast a genjutsu to put the thing to sleep. He then tried his best to close the cocoon back up, though to his own self-admission, the thing wouldn't really stay closed. So he gave up on it. He swam back to the surface of the water and gripped the roots of the large flower and began to haul himself back up. Once he was out of the water, he released a quick burst of pressure via his chakra to instantaneously dry him off. He continued to walk through the base. It was obvious that this Madara fellow was planning something a bit more than just gathering all the tailed beasts. Perhaps this could be used in service to Nagato, sure. But if it was planned to be used that way, he would have informed Nagato about it sooner. He continued to move about until he heard what sounded like voices in the distance. He began to make his way closer. Peeking around the corner, he witnessed Madara speaking to another that was revealed to be Zetsu. It was then that Yahiko made the connection that this Akatsuki member was likely the same as those creatures growing underwater. They were speaking about something, the Ten Tails and the Eye of the Moon plan. Yahiko's mind began to connect dots and he remembered that they let this man decide who would be put into the ranks of the Akatsuki. 
Yahiko was mortified to realize at this point that the Akatsuki that he had formed years prior was no longer his own, but Madara's. He had moved right in, manipulated his way to the top, and was now the one in full control of the Akatsuki, and the only person who could stand in his way was Nagato. He needed him for some reason. As he listened to the two of them talk, he realized that it was Nagato's Rinnegan. Nagato was the only one capable of controlling the demonic statue of the Outer Path, and that they required his cooperation to revive the Tentails. He was a figurehead, and the only thing that could fulfill their wishes. That was why they needed him, and that was what they were doing to manipulate Nagato. Yahiko turned to leave, but suddenly found himself face to face with the Zetsu from earlier. He let out a terrified gasp that, to his terror, echoed across the room, catching the attention of Black Zetsu and Tobi. As it stood there, the Zetsu was passive, just staring at him, as if it knew he wasn't supposed to be there, yet debating whether it should raise an alarm due to this man being one of their group and technically having possible clearance to be here. Yahiko believed he might be able to slip right by it, but the moment Tobi called out for whoever was out there to show themselves, the Zetsu gripped Yahiko's throat and carried him out into the open. Madara approached him and gave him a sigh of disappointment. Ah, Yahiko, why did you have to do that? Black Zetsu approached from behind him. He's seen and heard too much. We can't allow him to leave. Madara thought about this for a moment. If he suddenly disappears, pain will grow suspicious. This man is the last thing on earth that pain truly cares about. If he were to go missing, especially after this afternoon, pain would more than likely confront me, and his cooperation would be at an end. Black Zetsu's one golden eye looked at Madara as his other white half lay dormant under its counterpart's control. What should we do then? Toby put his hand on Yahiko's head and invaded his mind with the power of the Sharingan. He glazed over all the information that he thought he might need and then placed his hand on Zetsu's head and commanded it to transform into an exact replica of Yahiko. We simply replace the real Yahiko with one that we can control. He looked to the Zetsu and then to Yahiko and gave the command. Lock him away. The Zetsu turned and began to walk away with Yahiko toward the brig. Toby returned his attention to Zetsu, and the two of them continued their talk on the matter. The Five Tails will soon be in our possession. That will be the beginning of our plot. Toby nodded. All we need to do is make sure that pain remains under our control by any means necessary. It is he, after all, that will be used to revive the true Madara from the dead. Pain, in the form of Conan, sat down upon the tongue of the statue that had at one time been their base. He, or should I say she, right now, stood and walked into the statue, deeper into their old hideout. Pain may have become the living embodiment of a concept, and perhaps his views had changed quite a bit, but he was still a human and was still capable of nostalgia. He walked through and found the table where their members used to sit around and play cards. He recalled the day when the Akatsuki was reborn. Like a phoenix rising from the ashes, Nagato was killed and Pain born in his place. Through the ashes of love and brotherhood, hatred and despair were given rise to. He wondered what it would have been like had Hanzo merely accepted them. What if Hanzo had simply agreed that they were doing good work and went through with his promise to let them mediate the various sides during the war? Fond memories rushed back to him, which almost caused him to smile. But as he walked deeper, he found the personal quarters that had been his own. It was mostly empty except for a few mementos. Payne had always been a sentimental type. That's why he was as he is now. His sentimentality had been transformed into a weapon to be used against not only himself, but others. This world was cruel and unforgiving. Should peace be any less cruel? He stepped past it and into Yahiko's room, which was the exact opposite of his. It was filled to the brim with knickknacks, dirty laundry, and discarded snack packages, all of which had haired over with mold and cockroaches in the time since the end of the first generation of the Akatsuki. It stank in there. Pain wondered if this room itself could be used as some biological weapon against their enemies. He was certain to close this door particularly as he walked out. Finally, he made his way into Conan's room. Her room was almost as bare as Pain's. The bed neatly made, the clothes were all in their proper compartments. The mementos Conan held were not too dissimilar from those that Nagato held, but it had been obvious that she favored Yahiko of the two of them. There were more items here from Yahiko than there had been of Nagato. Conan had always had a deep crush on Yahiko, and it had always been Nagato's belief that Yahiko reciprocated, but that the both of them were far too nervous to mention it to the other. He sat on her bed and looked at the picture frame sitting lovingly by the bedside table. It was a picture of the three of them and Jiraiya, all together. Such simple times. But times before that were hard. They didn't know if they'd survive. They were living day to day, and yet they had each other. The love in their hearts filled their bellies, and on the occasions when they would eat whatever slop they had scrounged together, whatever it was, so long as they ate it together, it felt like a feast. Like the best meal in the world. 
When Jiraiya came, they developed into a true family, and it was the first time that Pain had ever felt as if he were a member of a greater family since the Second Shinobi World War had claimed his parents. Despite no longer starving and having enough food, Pain felt as if he were just barely hanging on to life. Technically, this was true. But one thing that was true was that he had no true internal damage. Yes, these rods were passing through his back, but it dealt no damage to his digestive system. He could eat if he wanted to, and perhaps even gain back the weight he once had, but he didn't. Why? Simply because he did not want to. Meals were empty now. Perhaps he had access to the greatest delicacies that Amegakure had to offer, but he had no taste in them. Not since... He stood and looked at the mirror hanging above the sink that Conan had near her bed. He saw her face, riddled with chakra rods. What had once been a simple piercing in her bottom lip that she had received voluntarily because she was feeling wild that day had suddenly turned into a porcupine of black rods through her nose and ears. Looking into this mirror, he could almost feel Conan judging him, as if she felt disgusted that her body was being defiled by pain. Opening the jacket, he noted that the hole in her chest was still there. How symbolic. The secret that Nagato had held on to for all these years was a simple one. He, like Yahiko, had fallen in love with Conan, but he'd said nothing to her. After all, he had known that Yahiko had been in love with her first and dared not make a move against his best friend. But as he looked back, he wondered what would have happened if he said anything at all. Maybe if he had, she might still be alive. Payne believed in peace. He had no other choice to now. It was all he was clinging to. He felt that if he ever forgot about peace, he would lose his drive to live and would simply fade away. But before, he hadn't really cared as much about war or peace. Not like Yahiko had. Nagato had been a blank slate, believing only in what he was told by Yahiko. All he wanted was a family. People to love and be loved by. If he had told Conan before, maybe they would have forsaken what now seemed like a pointless goal. Maybe she would still be here, and the three of them would be living safely somewhere else. But hesitation gave rise to loss, and from that, Payne had learned a valuable lesson. If there was something you wanted, you took it without hesitation. Because the longer you waited to act, the riskier it became, the closer to losing it you became. That was why Payne had vowed to himself that if ever one day he wanted something, he would take it and no one would stop him. And right now, he wanted to achieve his goals. And his singular goal was peace through war and nobody would take that away from him. Conan's form stood in the main hall, looking out of a window at the village hidden in the rain. Every time he gazed to the heavens, it seemed as if the skies, the angels above, wept upon this world. And why wouldn't they? Every day, the innocent died with the unjust. Payne had this day decided to do something uncharacteristic. After his conversation with Yahiko, Payne began to wonder if it truly was time to let go to let go of the pain of the past, perhaps try a new way to bring peace. But the world just kept disappointing him, over and over again, without fail. He had walked here, trudging through the rain, through the streets he had frequented as a child, thinking that a trip down memory lane might help him re-establish who Nagato was, what it was like to not be this weaponized version of himself, an extremist of peace. It was there that he found something that reminded him of pain. There was a child, a little girl in the streets, laying in the gutter, unable to move, barely conscious, her bones visible through her flesh. Starved, she couldn't even open her eyes. He lifted her up with the arms of Conan, knowing that at one time this had been himself. Looking down upon the little girl, he thought he glimpsed an image of Conan in her pale, sunken face. That little girl was currently in a bed in the building. Of course, she had died. He knew he couldn't save her from the beginning but he didn't want her to suffer alone in that gutter. This little girl had known pain, and he sympathized. He hoped that maybe in giving her a warm bed to die in, she might just feel some semblance of peace. In keeping her warm, his hand in hers, maybe, just maybe, she wouldn't be scared. But no, as the Reaper entered the room, Nagato thought he caught a glimpse of it with his Rinnegan, yet when he turned to look, there was nothing. He saw the girl crying, terror in her eyes, voice too weak to speak only a breathy exclamation to be heard. Please, I don't want to die. Nagato looked out over the village hidden in the rain, the body of Conan as his avatar. It truly was as if the angels themselves were weeping over this world. And this was why, if Nagato had any more tears left to shed, he would have. Within him, he felt a melding cauldron of emotions. Disappointment, yet feeling as if he should expect no less of a world full of callous individuals. He was angry, 
wishing to lash out to punish the village. For a moment, he considered some form of judgment on this village, a blood payment to be made. But in the end, he let out a sigh and let all of his feelings go. This was the way of the world. The just died with the unjust, and those who had no protection, the weakest of us, fell to the rule of the jungle. The strong survive, the weak perish. The very system Nagato wanted to change showed up before his face and spat into it, showing him cruelty. He no longer wanted to try and change to fit Yahiko's ideals. Now was not the time to let the pain go. No, pain was all around and would remain all around. He was the embodiment of this world's pain. It was said that those bearing the Rinnegan were to be gods of creation or gods of destruction. They embodied the cycle of birth and rebirth, the samsara, hence the name of the dojutsu, and it was time for rebirth, and rebirth could not happen unless something died. Something born must perish to be reborn. This world needed to perish to be reborn as a new world, with a new order. Yahiko believed he could save this world, but salvaging it was almost impossible. He had been reminded of it. This world was a big mess, and now, now he had to clean it up even if he had to do so by himself. It was then that Madara entered the room. He turned back to look at the man with the swirling mask. Where is Yahiko? Nagato asked, as if already knowing that Madara had something to do with this. Madara stood there. You expect me to keep track of your brother. He's not my responsibility. Conan's form took a few steps closer to him in an intimidating fashion. I know you and he had an issue. If he disappeared, then it most likely has to do with you. If you've hurt him, you will not enjoy the fate I will give you. Madara let out a groan of distaste. You are always so dramatic. I have nothing to do with Yahiko. If he doesn't turn up, that's on him. But I'm certain he will, unless he's finally fed up with our idea of peace. Conan took a step back. You had better pray. Madara raised his hands, as if attempting to get some unknown entity to take in the situation and be judge for them. And here I came to deliver some fantastic news. Nagato raised a brow ever so slightly. Madara continued, We've captured Han. He awaits you by the ghetto statue. Nagato sighed as if the change of subject left him feeling uncomfortable. Take me to him. Pain followed Madara to the ghetto statue where before it, on an altar, the bound and unconscious body of Han rested. The other Akatsuki members were surrounding the altar in a wide circle. Madara did not join the ranks as he preferred to remain unseen. Pain walked to Han. He placed his hand on the Jinchuriki and suddenly a red glow appeared, his tailed beast being pulled from him out of the mouth and eyes. Those standing around began to offer up their chakra as Nagato forced the beast into the statue. Pain looked upon the statue as one of the nine eyes seemed to open. Silence passed for a few moments. He then spoke without turning. Take the Jinchuriki and lay him to rest and within my room, the child that has passed lay her to rest as well. He turned and began to leave. Toby followed him off. One beast down, eight to go. I already have the other members of the Akatsuki scouting them out. Conan's strides were brisk and sure, Nagato feeling a rush of confidence in his desires. All the while, the orange hair of Yahiko appeared. Pain stopped and looked to him. He looked back at Madara for a moment before returning his attention to Yahiko. Welcome back. Yahiko smiled. Pain passed by. Madara looked at the face of Yahiko and smiled beneath his mask, knowing that his Zetsu clone had fooled Pain. As he tried to walk by, however, a hand was held out to stop him from moving past. Suddenly, the air shifted as tension filled the room. Madara was startled. He looked to Yahiko, who looked to him and smiled. You expected me to be so casually defeated by your paper soldier. Did you even bother to check who was in the cell before you left? Madara was surprised. It seemed that when they sent the Zetsu to imprison Yahiko, that Yahiko had managed to get the better of Zetsu and imprison him instead. It was then that Madara knew his goose was got. Yahiko had the information. He had been assaulted. Madara knew that Pain would trust Yahiko no matter what. There was no way he wouldn't. He suddenly began checking through whatever cards he had left. He could not afford to lose Pain's cooperation. Currently, everything rides upon it. What can I do? Madara asked within his own mind. Kill him? No, Pain would notice. Kamui, if I manage to teleport Yahiko out without Pain knowing, I can replace him. I can still salvage this. But just as he prepared to use it, Yahiko spoke. Nagato, I have something important to tell you before this guy tries to kill me. Pain turned around to look. Damn it, Toby exclaimed within his mind. What was there to do now? 
right before him, all of his time plotting. Every night he spent awake manipulating events, it was all going down the drain. He didn't have enough time to think this through. It was over. It was well and truly over. Yahiko continued, Madara is plotting against you and I have proof. Pain stepped forward, proof. Yahiko nodded. He has an army laying in wait and he attacked me. Currently there's a being with my face locked up in a prison cell. He attempted to have me replaced because I overheard his conversation. Madara looked to Yahiko. Oh, how rich, he said, attempting to sow the seeds of doubt in Payne's mind, the only thing he could do right now. You truly dislike the way we're attempting to bring peace, but to actively sabotage your friend? That's not a low I ever expected from you, Yahiko. Yahiko looked back to Madara. It's not a lie and you know it. He looked back at Payne. Nagato, look into my eyes. I'm not lying to you. I have proof. I have a set of coordinates. If you don't believe me, go to those coordinates and see for yourself. He gives Payne a slip of paper with numbers written on them. Payne looks at them before looking up at Yahiko again. I will investigate this. Payne turned to walk away. Yahiko called out, You gotta do it now, or Toby will move everything and destroy the evidence. Payne looked back. I will. I seek a map to tell the coordinates with. Until then, Madara, do not leave my sight. If you flee, I will take it to mean that you're guilty. Madara stepped forward. I have nothing to hide, Payne. He walked beside Payne and looked back at Yahiko. Unbeknownst to Yahiko, Black Zetsu had heard it all and knew that there was no time to waste. Returning to the base, Zetsu quickly set off the failsafe, a bomb that would obliterate the entirety of the mountain's graveyard, save the hidden area where the Zetsu were being stored. It would be covered, but not destroyed. A moment later, Pain, Yahiko, and Madara appear. Madara looks around. See? There's nothing here. Yahiko looks around. That's because you destroyed it. It's here. You can even see the dust coming off the newly fallen rubble. Madara scoffed. A cave-in. That's a natural occurrence. No proof of anything. Yahiko raised his finger to put it into Madara's face and tell him off, but before he could, Pain stopped them. Yahiko turned to Pain. Nagato, you've got to believe me. Madara looked to Pain. He's always stood against our ideals. His view of peace is too weak to be attained. He's attempting to sabotage you because he's too scared to take the necessary steps. Yahiko turned back to Pain and gripped him by the collar of his cloak. Nagato, listen, you've got to believe me. I will admit I don't like your way of doing things, and even to a point I've considered sabotaging you, but I'm telling you the truth. It was here, and Madara wants to overthrow you. You've got to believe me. I wouldn't lie about your safety. You're my brother. We grew up together. We both, we both loved Conan. You know me. I swear on Conan's grave. It was here. Payne looked into Yahiko's eyes and saw the conviction within. He turned to Madara. Your assistance is no longer required. He took a step toward Madara, but Madara disappeared into his Kamui dimension. Yahiko sighed in relief. Payne turned back toward him. I believe you, but do not think that this changes anything. I will still awaken the Tentails and bring peace to this world through Payne. Yahiko hated that, but he was simply glad that Nagato was safe for now. He could try to change his mind again later. Right now, what was most important was ensuring that he was safe, and that meant expelling Madara and Zetsu from the ranks of the Akatsuki. The issue with that was the current Akatsuki was formed by Tobi, so once he and Zetsu were gone, so were they. The Akatsuki seemed fairly small thereafter. This hardly changed anything. Nagato simply believed that he and Yahiko could and would pick up the slack. But this is not how the story ends. Tobi and his Akatsuki splinter group would not remain inactive forever. At first, it seemed they might, but a single interaction changed that. Toby stood on a tree, overlooking the vast forest that seemed to stretch on as far as the eye could see. He let out a sigh as he was unsure what to do next. From behind, Zetsu appeared. That did not go according to plan. Toby shook his head. We need those Rinnegan. Without them, we cannot hope to finish our Eye of the Moon plan. Zetsu sat there for a time. Perhaps we don't. Toby turned to look back at Zetsu. Explain. I have told you how the Rinnegan is created, have I not? Toby thought about it. Zetsu continued. The Sage of Six Paths was the one who bore the Rinnegan, but it can be awakened through the mixing of Chakra. The Sage's sons, Indra and Ashura, continually reincarnate. If Indra and Ashura's Chakra mix, the Sage of Six Paths Chakra is created, and a new Rinnegan awakens. As Indra, Madara simply added the genetic material of Ashura, the one known as Hashirama Senju, and it created Six Paths Chakra within him, awakening his Rinnegan. Toby stood there. What does this have to do with anything? I do not have access to Madara's cells like I do Hashirama's. 
Zetsu explained. Madara was but one reincarnation among many. The same is true of Ashura and Hashirama. With Madara's death, another will soon be born to carry his chakra. How do you know this? Toby asked. Zetsu's evil smile began to crawl up his face. I am the essence of Madara's will made incarnate to guide you. I know my master and where and when he will be born. It's up to you to do as you will with him. Toby thought about it. Fair. What do you propose? And so time passed. Toby knew that Nagato would stop at nothing to retrieve the Tentails, but he could not let this occur. He had to keep the Tentails out of Nagato's hands just long enough. He knew that the Akatsuki, as it stood, could not stand up against the might of the Rinnegan, but it was not impossible to stall. He had one thing Pain did not have, connections. He would use his connections to find where the current Jinchuriki were, and instead of capturing them, he would attempt to have them assassinated. The death of a Jinchuriki could be covered up. After all, most villages hated their Jinchuriki, and by killing them, he would set Pain back, keeping the tailed beasts from respawning for quite some time. And without the tailed beasts, Nagato could not complete the plan first. All the while, Black Zetsu kept his eyes on Konoha. Soon, he thought to himself, soon Indra will be reborn, and when he is, we may proceed. And as this struggle between the two factions of the Akatsuki, Daybreak and Nightfall as they came to be known, Akatsuki and Nichibotsu, the sound of a baby's crying set alight the fire of the war anew. Toby wandered the streets of Konoha. The sweltering heat of the summer made his long cloak feel like a steam house. Outside of the hospital, he knew that the babe had been born. According to Zetsu, it was the child of Fugaku and Makoto Uchiha, the next Madara. The plan was simple, a genjutsu on a nurse and the retrieval of a babe. He stood outside as the nurse he had chosen began to make her way to the nursery where the child named Sasuke awaited. It wasn't like anyone expected this, nor would anyone really care save Makoto and Fugaku. The nurse would wheel off the baby inconspicuously and eventually pick it up and bring it to the exit of the hospital where she would present it to Toby. Toby would then free her from the genjutsu, causing her to pass out. It was as simple as that, in and out. Utilizing his Kamui, he took the infant with him. He eventually returned to Zetsu in their new base, where everything had been moved. I have the child. Zetsu would look upon it and smile. Very good. Now, time to begin the procedure. The dark shadow of a man lifted a scalpel. This was a bit more than Toby was truly comfortable with, but he remembered why he was doing this. Will it truly work? Even after introducing Hashirama's cell to his body, it took Madara decades to awaken his Rinnegan. Zetsu nodded to him. Indeed, it did, but he only took a small portion of Hashirama's cells at an old age. I plan to replace 50% of this child's body with Hashirama Senju's DNA. And at such an early moment in development, as the baby grows, so too shall the cells. I predict it will awaken the Rinnegan no less than six years from now. Toby turned away as Zetsu began to work. When he was done, Toby got to see the child. It was kept under anesthesia for most of the healing process, a close eye kept on it to ensure that it didn't die. Toby remembered viewing it during that time. Its entire right side was made of the same pale substance as his own. It was as if Zetsu were mocking Toby by replicating his wounds on this child. We must raise it until it develops the Rinnegan, Toby said to Zetsu. Zetsu nodded, and so they did. Toby would take responsibility for the child's safety and would attempt to keep it entertained as Zetsu continued their work. The child had a beaming smile, not too dissimilar from his own at a young age. He raised his own hand and looked at the pale skin, lacking pigmentation. The child, Sasuke, would raise his own hand and press it against Toby's, showing that they were the same. And as the child grew, its joyous mentality was nearly infectious. Was this what Madara was before the world corrupted him? Toby would wonder. He would attempt to indoctrinate Sasuke with his beliefs, and Sasuke would take to them, but his own smile had gone untainted as he knew he wanted to do what was best for the world. His smile was a dangerous thing. Sasuke needed to know what the world was like, how cruel it could be. He needed to turn that overabundance of love into pure, unabating hatred. But every time he attempted to show him that, Toby would stop. In the darkness where Toby lived, no light shined down from the surface. He was starved of kindness and love, and yet this child appeared in his life. Are you going to teach me something more, Papa? The child would ask as Toby entered the room. Toby would slowly remove his mask for the first time. He had never shown Sasuke his face. At first, it was out of secrecy, and then as he warmed to the child, it was out of fear that Sasuke might be terrified of him. But now, now he just wanted to see Sasuke with his own eyes, and to be seen as he truly was by Sasuke. 
Sasuke looked at him curiously as he removed his mask, the child's eyes widening in horror. Toby nodded. This is what the world does to you, Sasuke. This is why we're doing this. I'm covered in so many scars and they'll never heal. The world's hurt me bad, Sasuke, and I don't want it to hurt you or anyone else. To his surprise though, Sasuke approached him and put his hands upon Obito's face. Daddy's been hurt. Sasuke would kiss Obito's scarred cheek. I want to heal you. Obito was startled by this reaction. Such purity. Such innocence. He knew he was in too deep. He knew that Sasuke would be useless to them like this. He said he wanted to help the world, but could he actually go through with this? What happened when someone stood against him, told him he was wrong? Would he cave? He needed to break Sasuke from this mentality, but it felt impossibly hard. He couldn't let this child lose the sparkle in his eye. This innocence. For a time, Toby wished to destroy it, but now all he could think of was protecting it. In his younger years, he had dreamed of the children he and Reen would have, but upon her death, he knew that such a thing had become impossible. But now, as this child was in his arms, he felt that old spark come back to life. It was as if Reen were there once more. He couldn't let that go. One night, however, Obito was spending time with Sasuke, reading him stories, playing games, solving puzzles, coloring, just having a grand old time. Sasuke then doubled over. Obito noticed this and came to him. Sasuke. The boy gripped his head. Papa! Papa, it hurts! Obito looked at him, his hands hovering around Sasuke as if he wanted to hug the child but was too scared to, afraid that it might cause him more pain. Papa, my head! It hurts so bad! Help me! Help me! Obito wasn't sure what to do. Sasuke began to fall forward. Obito caught Sasuke and lifted him into his arms. He carried him to his bedroom and laid the child down on the bed. Sasuke wept, gripping his head. Obito called for Zetsu, a black amalgamous mass formed in the center of the room and rose to full height. It appears to be awakening, his Rinnegan. Suddenly, Sasuke's back arched as he let out a cry. His eyes opened as they became rippling circles from the centermost part of the eye to the outermost. He fell back, just breathing. Obito looked at him. S Sasuke. Sasuke looked at him for a moment. Papa. He then passed out. Obito took a breath. It seemed like the worst was behind them. At that moment, he noticed the black hand of Zetsu inching ever so close to the face of Sasuke. He gripped it. What are you doing? Zetsu looked at Obito, his expression having not changed at all. I'm taking the Rinnegan. Or did you forget that this is why we brought the child here? Toby continued to hold the hand. I think this boy could be more used to us alive. There's no need to harvest the Rinnegan. There is a need, Zetsu said. You think I've not seen you and this child together? You love him, and love is a dangerous emotion to our mission. We kidnapped this child to force him to awaken the Rinnegan, and now that we have, he will give it to us. Obito stood and sighed, letting go of Zetsu's arm. I'm sorry. You're right. Zetsu then began to move closer to Sasuke's Rinnegan. Suddenly, Obito turned around and struck Zetsu down. You're right. I do love Sasuke, and I'm not going to let you or anyone hurt him. Zetsu was startled, but a part of him wasn't actually surprised. Fool. I didn't think you'd be willing to give up everything for this boy. Obito knelt down to the dying creature. Who said I gave anything up? What was yours and my plan will now simply be mine and his. You are not needed anymore. Zetsu looked at him with a single fiery glare. Bastard. Obito returned this glare with a fireball jutsu, burning the remnants of Zetsu away. He then turned to Sasuke with a sigh. You and me, that's all we need. Just us. We'll take the Nine Tails and every other tailed beast, and we will complete our plan. Together. All the while, Pain waits patiently. He receives word that one of the tailed beasts have regenerated. It seems that the hunt is once more in full force. Yahiko stood on the balcony of the Amekage, or so he had assumed the position to be called, reading the newspaper. A fourth world war, he said, hardly able to believe it. He turned back to Pain, who stood there in the guise of Conan. Have you seen this? Yahiko asked. Payne looked at the paper in his hand. This was going to happen eventually. Yahiko shook his head as his back slid down the wall into a sitting position. This is our fault. We did this. People are dying. War is being waged because of us. This is the way of the human race, Payne said. With or without us, this was always the end result. The difference is, while in times past, this war would have occurred, ended, and then sowed seeds of discourse through nations eventually turning the world into a powder keg that would spark into World War V. But us? We plan to use this to our advantage. To end the fighting. To end the wars and skirmishes, the uprisings and conquests. To end war altogether. It may be a hard choice to make, but in the end, it's the right one. 
The disarray will cover our tracks and make us undetectable. You're a monster, Yahiko said as he sat there looking at Pain. You're a monster. Pain thought about it as he looked out over the soggy village, drenched in tears he no longer had the ability to cry. Yes, I am. I am a monster, Yahiko, and that's okay. Because the world needs a monster. It needs something scary and terrifying. It needs a killer to kill the killers. A monster to slay the monsters. I thought you would have learned this by now, but I suppose you will always remain that idealistic child. You couldn't save Conan. You couldn't save me. You think you'll save the world? I was too weak, and because I couldn't kill you, Conan is dead, he said, pulling the jacket open to expose the gaping, festering wound that would have completely deteriorated if not for Nagato's power. This is the cost of your weakness, Yahiko. This is the cost of idealism in a realistic world. You don't get to have your cake and eat it too. But you will make the bed and sleep in it, Yahiko fired back. Payne's eyes bore a deep, sharp, burning stare. I will make and sleep in as many beds as I must until the end result is achieved. You don't seem to understand. Bringing peace is not about me. And it's not about you. It's not about Conan and it's not about the Hidden Rain Village. It's about the world. The whole. Everyone. My ideals. Your ideals. Our conscience. Our lives. None of that matters. What matters is the future of the human race. And if you're not going to help me, then leave. I do not have time, nor will I continue to hold your hand like this. No more of your nonsense. I'm finished with it. Either stow it up or move yourself out. Payne turned around and began to leave. Yahiko was left by himself. He was thinking about what had been said. Maybe I should then. He would stand and move to his bedroom where he would take his things and put them in a bag. He removed his Akatsuki cloak and laid it out on the bed in his quarters and proceeded to leave. Later that day, the form of Conan made its way through the base, slightly curious as to where Yahiko had gotten off to. Stopping by his room, he would look in and notice that the room was cleaned out and that the bed was neatly made, something unusual for Yahiko. However, resting neatly on the bed was the Akatsuki cloak and a note that simply said, I quit on it. Payne looked at it and sighed. He was both surprised and unsurprised. He always knew Yahiko was soft. When Nagato's eyes opened, he saw the truth. He knew the truth. Yahiko never did. He refused to do so, so his departure was no surprise to him. What was a surprise about it was that he would abandon his friend, his brother. Nagato, on this side of things, could not believe that Yahiko would betray him like this. But all the same, this did not change anything. Pain did not need him, and the cause would be better off without him. Now Pain could focus all of his mental power toward the process of getting the remaining tailed beasts. Now he just needed to acquire the remaining tailed beasts before Nichibotsu. Yahiko himself had left Ame entirely. He needed to go somewhere, be with someone he knew. He needed to find someone he could trust. There was one. There was one he knew and one he prayed yet lived. Jiraiya-sensei. I need to find Jiraiya-sensei. He'll know what to do. And so off Yahiko ran, leaving the daybreak behind him. Running through the open plains, the forests, camping by night under the sky and rising with the sun. Jiraiya was sleeping in today. He had taken quite a few weeks investigating the various threats that faced the world, one of them being Akatsuki, the other being Nichibotsu. These two opposing ideals, mixed with the fact that the red and blue clouded warriors had been at war with each other, made him believe that two very different yet similar cabals were attempting to sow discord in the world, and that this fourth shinobi world war was one of them. For the most part, Konoha was not included in this war, as they possessed the Ninetales, the strongest of all tailed beasts, and was one of few nations to retain their beasts in the sudden assassination attempts that took place in the world. But that was only because the current Jinchuriki was married to the Hokage, a man of incredible strength and power, Jiraiya's own student, Minato Namikaze. It was Minato's quick action that had so far kept Konoha out of any danger. Considering their possession of the tailed beasts and Lady Kushina's training to make use of it, something she could now only do with Minato's help, it left Konoha as one of the sole military powers in the world and by far the strongest of them all. The gates of the walled village said Konohagakure on the front, but to the rest of the world it might as well have said mess around and find out. That was the whole mentality of the situation, and so that's what Jiraiya was doing, taking one long mid-afternoon catnap, Hokage's orders. That was at least until a loud knock on the door was heard. Jiraiya's eyes shot open. Upon the second knock, his eyes rolled in his head just as his body did in bed, attempting to get out. Standing up, he walked to the door and opened it. What is it? Can't an old man get some? He came face to face with an orange-haired boy. At first, his face looked him up and down, searching for a reason why this face might be so nostalgically familiar. Yeah, yeah. Hello, master. Jiraiya hugged the boy, pulling him into his embrace as he had done so many years earlier. 
Eventually pulling away, Yahiko smiled at his master. Jiraiya would essentially drag him into his home and sit him down in the cushiest chair, beginning to uncork the best sake he had. The oldest, noblest, and most foreign sake with a name he could never hope to pronounce. He brought the glasses and sat them down on the table. What brings you to this part of the world, Yahiko? Are Conan and Nagato with you? Yahiko's smile twisted through a sudden infusion of stress that almost broke through his emotional barrier that had already taken a hit from seeing his long-lost mentor after so many years. Tears almost flowed down his cheeks, but stopped right on the lids of his eyes. Master. Jiraiya's expression turned to one of shock and worry. What is it, Yahiko? Yahiko began to explain. Master, there's been a change of situation. Yahiko began to spin a tale for Jiraiya. He spoke of the good work they started and how it all fell apart when Conan met her untimely demise. Hearing of Conan's death struck a chord in Jiraiya and nearly drove him to tears, something it did manage to do in Yahiko. Yahiko told his mentor of the wounds and current physical condition of Nagato. He told him of how he had been warped and transformed. He told Jiraiya about the pain persona. Jiraiya could not believe his ears. Yahiko then told him about the war, the tailed beasts, and about one's waging war, the Akatsuki and the Nichibotsu. Jiraiya's mouth was left agape. N Nagato is the leader of Akatsuki? And he's currently at war with Madara Uchiha? Yahiko nodded. I know that sounds crazy. After all, Madara should have been dead a long time, but that's the name we were given. Jiraiya was left stunned. Minato had been right. They simply needed to calm down. He would eventually look up to Yahiko. Are you okay, Yahiko? Yahiko shook his head. It all fell apart, Sensei, he said, his whining voice trembling under his tears. Our dreams, our goals, our team, even our family. We looked up to Hanzo and killed Conan. And after that, everything went to hell. And Amegakure has been overtaken by Nagato and the Akatsuki, and somewhere, Madara Uchiha's splinter group is attempting to capture tailed beasts. I don't know what to do. I had to come to you to get advice. I wanted peace, and I accidentally started the Fourth Shinobi World War. Could you get anything more ass-backward than that? Jiraiya hugged his student. Don't worry, we're going to fix this. To start with, we're gonna go visit Minato, alright? Yahiko, face still buried in Jiraiya's chest, nodded in agreement. Elsewhere, outside of the village, Obito stood in his mask. He saw Konoha in its entirety. Such a beautiful village. So much nostalgia. So many memories. Sasuke, still only about seven years old, looked out over the village as well. Obito knelt down to Sasuke to look him in the eyes. This is the village where you were born, Sasuke. It's the reason why I love it most. It gave me... He booked the boy's nose. You. Sasuke smiled. Are we really going to destroy it, Papa? Can't we just let it stay? Obito nodded. We can let it stay, but the chances of success for that depend heavily on the success of your mission. I can't be seen here, but you? You're an Uchiha, and you're just a child. They wouldn't suspect you to be working for the Akatsuki. So here's what you do. Go in, study, and learn where the Nine Tails is currently located, then report back to me. After that, I'll sneak in, take the Nine Tails for myself, and we can leave this village behind. Let it remain this beautiful forever. Sasuke agreed. He would then be teleported into the village. Remember, Sasuke, if you need me, come straight to this wall and knock three times. When I hear the knock, I'll come and retrieve you. Now go, on your way. Sasuke would simply skip off into the village, humming to himself. Obito shook his head at the happy-go-lucky nature of the child. It was almost like it was the most normal, natural thing he had ever done. He was such a far cry from Madara that it wasn't even funny. Had it been Madara here, he would have desired to rub this entire village out of the world's picture, but Sasuke wanted to protect it, to save it. It was endearing. Looking down at his own hand, Obito couldn't help but wonder at the changes in himself. He never thought he would love anything again, in any capacity. But Sasuke had taught him differently. He could love something, and he found something worth dying for. Within the village itself, Sasuke skipped through wearing his standard black high-collar shirt with the Uchiha crest printed on the back something that would not draw much attention to him. After all, he was an Uchiha, so his presence among a sea of other Uchiha granted him the anonymity to hide in plain sight. As the day went by though, despite listening in and trying to draw the information out of anyone, Sasuke could not find anything about the current Ninetales Jinchuriki. He was beginning to feel discouraged, and so he took a seat on the swing set and just kicked his feet with the most forlorn look on his face. It also just so happened to be at that moment that a particular blonde-headed boy was at that park. The look of sadness on Sasuke's face is what drew him in. After all, in the boy's heart, he knew that nobody should be sad, right? He approached Sasuke for the first time. Hi, was the simple interjection that pulled Sasuke back to reality. 
Hi, he responded back. Do you want to play with me? Sasuke thought about it. I can't. I have a mission to do. Mission? What kind? Naruto asked. Sasuke raised a hand to cover his mouth. I can't say because it's a secret. Naruto kicked the ground disappointedly. Well, want to play? Sasuke shook his head. No, I can't. I'm on a secret mission. Naruto looked back. Maybe if you play with me a little, you'll be able to solve your problem. My dad always tells me that when you have an issue you can't solve, just forget about it for a little while and the answer will just show up. Sasuke looked at him. Does that work? Naruto nods. Whenever I lose something, I do that and I always find what I lost. Sasuke thinks about whether this would work in the situation he's in or not. Regardless, he feels the draw to play with someone his age, as he's never really been around other kids. His duty-bound spirit and adventure-filled heart wage a small battle over his attention, with his heart eventually winning out in the end. And so Sasuke and Naruto play a little. Sasuke finds himself having the best time of his life, something he never expected to happen. For a time, the two play, but as the sun sets, Naruto says he needs to go, but promises to be back tomorrow. Sasuke smiles and waves goodbye to him before making his way back to the wall where he taps three times and is teleported out and back to camp with Obito. Sasuke sits by the campfire as Obito begins to put the food on the plates. How was your investigation? He asked. Investigation? Sasuke asks cluelessly. Obito does a double take. Investigation? The whole reason why you're even in the village? What the heck were you doing? Sasuke pops the side of his own head with the palm of his hand. Investigation! I forgot! Obito's head hangs down and slowly shakes from side to side. What in the world were you doing in there that you forgot your own mission? Sasuke looks away with shame. Then he looks back. I was playing with another boy named Naruto. Obito sighs and then hands him his food. It wasn't like he didn't get it. Sasuke had grown up in seclusion. He had never seen another village before, or another person outside of the Akatsuki for that matter. His curiosity was something everyone possessed, and his reaction was only natural. I'm glad you had fun, Sasuke, and I'm glad you made a new friend, but you gotta try and stay on task. If you don't find the Nine Tails before Pain gets here, the village won't exist anymore and your friend will die. Sasuke gasped. He'll kill Naruto? Obito nodded. Yes, that's why you have to do your best. I know you want to play, and I promise that you'll get to later, but right now you need to find the Nine Tails. When all of this is over, I promise that you'll get to play with Naruto all you want, but until then, please focus. Sasuke nodded solemnly. Itachi passed the plate to him before kissing his head. Still, I'm proud of you for making a friend. Use him as a reason to complete your mission. Sasuke smiles. Okay. The day after, Sasuke continues his search. He's not quite sure where to go, so he sits at the park to think. Perhaps that's what it was, or perhaps he was just hoping to see Naruto again. Either way, he succeeds. Naruto appears and runs up to him. Hi, Sasuke. Wanna play? Sasuke shakes his head. No thanks. I gotta complete my mission. What was your mission again? Naruto asks. Sasuke thinks about it. Well, I guess it's okay if I tell you. He whispers into Naruto's ear. I gotta find the Nine Tails Jinchuriki. She's the only person left who can save the world. I wanna find her so we can end all the wars. Naruto gasps and covers his mouth. I know who the Nine Tails Chicken Jerky is. Sasuke is surprised. Really? Naruto nods. It's my mom. She's the Nine Tails Jerky. Can I meet her? Sasuke asks. Naruto nods. Sure, come on. Naruto would run off with Sasuke, leading him toward their house where Kushina was. He opens the door. Mom, I'm home. Kushina, drying her hands off with a towel, peeks around the corner. Welcome home, Naruto. She walks over and lifts him with a twirl and hugs him. So cute, I could just eat your cheeks. Naruto laughs. Mom, stop, not in front of my new friend. Kushina is surprised. Your new friend. She looks back and sees Sasuke standing there. Oh, hello, who are you? Sasuke smiles. I'm Sasuke Uchiha. Are you the Ninetales? Kushina suddenly freezes. She looks to Naruto out of the corner of her eye and then back to the boy. H who told you such a thing? Sasuke points to Naruto. She looks to Naruto. Oh, and who else might he have told? She asks, her smiling face growing redder and redder, a vein bulging ever so slightly. Nobody, Mama, just one person. One too many, Naruto. Didn't Daddy tell you to not tell people that I'm the Ninetales Jinchuriki? Naruto points to Sasuke. He said he wanted to meet you. He said that you could save the world. I have to show you to him so we could save the world. Kushina sighed. I don't think I can save the world, Sasuke. I'm sorry to disappoint. Sasuke smiles and gives her a hug. It's okay. My mission's accomplished. I can now tell daddy where to find you. Kushina's surprised. Your dad? Where to find me? What do you mean? 
Sasuke smiles. I'll be back. I just need to go get my daddy. Sasuke runs out the door. Kushina just stares in shock. We might have an issue. Sasuke returned to camp where Obito was just finishing lunch. Obito was beginning to plate it. So, where have you been? He asked. Just at Naruto's house? Obito's shoulders dropped as he rolled his head on his neck. He slammed the utensils down on the table. Damn it, Sasuke. I told you to stay focused and find the Ninetales. Sasuke looked about ready to cry. B but I did. I found her. Why are you mad at me? Obito was confused. Tears rolled down Sasuke's cheeks. I yeah. Yeah, she, she's Naruto's mom. Obito rushed over to Sasuke and began wiping away his tears, trying to shush him. Don't cry, Sasuke. Don't cry. I made a mistake. I didn't know. I thought you were goofing off. I'm not mad at you. I promise. Y you promise? Obito nodded. Yes, I promise. Now just tell me where Naruto lives. Looking over the village was pain. The tailed beast was somewhere here. Once this beast was found and loaded into the statue, the Ten Tails would awaken, and the peace he had fought for over these many years would finally be within reach. Elsewhere in the village, Yahiko and Jiraiya were speaking with Minato about this, telling the story. Minato understood. The Akatsuki are led by your former pupil. That's unnerving. What did you teach him? Jiraiya shook his head. Not much. Not that he needed it to be dangerous. He possessed the Rinnegan. Minato is shocked. The Rinnegan? Are you serious? Jiraiya nodded. Is there is there any hope you could talk him out of attacking the village? Minato asked. Jiraiya looks at Yahiko, and Yahiko thinks for a moment. I don't think so. Minato sighed. Then we need to gather our forces and launch a preemptive strike before he can attack. Suddenly there was an explosion in the village. A group of large animals appeared and began to wreck the place. Minato stood and looked out the window. What is it? Yahiko looked. Shit. It's the animal path. It's pain. Minato looked back. We're going to have to deal with this here then. Jiraiya, you're with me. We need to confront him. Yahiko, I need you to go to my home and defend my wife. She's the Ninetales Jinchuriki. You can't let him take her. Yahiko nods. After that, the three of them spread out and head their separate ways. Yahiko begins jumping from rooftop to rooftop. He looks over and sees Minato and Jiraiya on their way to fight Nagato. At this moment, Konoha's military force was beginning to mobilize. Yahiko jumped across the sky with great agility until he made his way to the home of the Hokage. There he entered the door. Miss Namikaze! Miss Namikaze! Where are you? He looks over and sees a pair of feet laying beside the couch. No, 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 no. He races over and finds a child. He lifts the blonde boy up a little. Hey, are you okay? The boy's eyes slowly open. He blinks a few times and then looks at Yahiko before suddenly jumping up and away. What did you do with my mom? He shouts as he pulls a kunai, a couple sizes too large for his hand. Suddenly, the boy almost passes out again. Yahiko catches him. Careful, you took a blow to your head. You haven't fully recovered yet. Are you okay? The boy looks to Yahiko. Where's my mom? Yahiko shakes his head. I don't know, but we gotta find her. Together, the two rush out of the home and begin attempting to track her. Suddenly, they witness a massive statue appear right in the middle of the village. This draws Payne's attention as well, as it appears to be the ghetto statue that was summoned, something that only Payne should be able to do. Both parties converge on the town square as Jiraiya and Minato are bogged down by the other five paths of Payne. All the while, Obito stands there and proceeds to pull the nine tails out of Kushina before putting it into the ghetto statue, awakening its ninth and final eye. At that time, Yahiko and Payne both show up. You're too late, he shouts. We've already completed the Ten Tails, and now it's for one person to absorb. He turns around. Do it, Sasuke. Remember the hand signs. Sasuke begins to weave hand signs. Pain suddenly rushes in, attempting to stop this before it happens. However, before he can, Toby appears before him and absorbs Pain into the Kamui realm. Don't you even think about hurting Sasuke, he says. Sasuke finishes the hand signs for the Six Paths Ten Tails Coffin Seal. Suddenly, the Ten Tails is pulled into Sasuke's body. Sasuke is at first surprised by the power, and then he suddenly is in a panic as the chakra overwhelms him. He feels like he's going to burst. He hits his knees and cries out, It hurts! Get it out, it hurts! Obito is shocked. Sasuke, you can do this! Push through! Remember why you're doing this! Sasuke screams out as his body's covered in scales. Fool, Pain says through Conan's body. You cannot expect a child to be capable of controlling such power. If he doesn't die, then his mind will be shredded. He'll never again be the person he was. Only the uncontrolled beast caged in a weak frame. Obito looked at Sasuke. Sasuke had always been strong, stronger than anyone. Stronger even than Obito himself. Come on, Sasuke, do it. Prove them wrong. The Ten Tails, in the form of Sasuke, stood at the full height of four and a half feet tall. Its Rinnegan were blazing. Obito, behind his mask, began to smile. He did it. He did it! Suddenly, Sasuke was in front of him, punching him in the stomach hard enough to send him through a wall. Obito was left there unconscious. Pain saw him and knew that the opportunity to take the Ten Tails for himself was slowly drawing to a close. He would need to do everything he could. He would form a chakra rod and strike Sasuke with it, only for it to do no damage. Yahiko was pulling back. He knew this was way out of his power range, so he did his best to keep Naruto safe behind him. Sasuke would press a Truth Seeker orb into Pain's stomach, blowing him into the air. 
pain barely caught themselves. Looking down and seeing the damage done to his sentimental vessel, he grew angrier. Angrier than he had ever been since the day he killed Hanzo. Diva Path, he shouted through Conan's voice as he placed his hands together. A pure black sphere began to appear in his hands. It seemed to bend light around it. Chibaku Tensei! The orb would float down to the ground where it would suddenly grow larger and begin to suck everything into its event horizon. Yahiko would grab Naruto and start running, where he could feel the pull of the singularity behind him. It was so dense that not even light could escape. Things were being pulled into it, including Sasuke. As more and more objects gathered around the event horizon and time slowed for them, the items began to form a densely packed celestial object, which possessed its own gravitational force. It hovered up into the air. Conan's face began to pull up with Pain's smile. Be it beast or child, be it beast or child, ignorance cannot be covered by power. Suddenly, the orb began to crack and crumble. Pain's smile began to dull. Suddenly, the orb fell apart as the ten tails floated there. In the blink of an eye, the beast in the form of a child would approach Pain and strike so hard into the ground that the very chakra rods within the body shattered, leaving it comatose. There was a cry from below. It caught the attention of the ten tails. It lowered to the ground to find Yahiko and Naruto. It approached with malevolent intent until it saw blood pouring from a wound in Naruto's leg. Yahiko was doing his best to wrap it up. The beast merely stood there and viewed this for a moment. Deep down, Sasuke felt as if he were a doll being ripped at the seams, stuffing falling out, the threads unraveling. He felt broken, destroyed, ruined. What was him and what was the beast? His desires and its desires all melded together. Monster, he said. I am a monster. We're a monster. He looked up and saw Naruto. No, Naruto, don't, don't hurt Naruto. He looked over and saw Obito still passed out in the building. Papa, no, no, I don't want to be like this. A voice then spoke. What's the matter, my son? Sasuke was crying. This isn't what I wanted. What did you want? The voice asked. I wanted to make the world a better place. I wanted to bring peace. Is that really what you wanted? The voice asked. I wanted to make daddy proud. I wanted to be loved, but this power, it's too much. Nobody should ever have it. It hurt people. The voice then appeared in front of him in the body of an old man. In his hand, he possessed a staff, and at the end of the staff was a loop, and in that loop, there was a thread. This power is not something to be held lightly. What is it that should be done with it? It should go away forever, Sasuke said. The man smiled. Ah, Indra, you were always so emotional, but you never knew what to do with it. Are you scared? Sasuke nodded. A lot. The man offered a soft smile. Don't be scared. You just need control. Great power requires great control. A fire can be used to burn down a forest, or it can be used to grant warmth in the winter. Water can drown you, or it can quench your thirst, just as a sword can kill people or protect others. There was a reason why I left the tailed beasts on Earth when I banished the Ten Tails. Do you know why? Sasuke shook his head, tears still dripping from his eyes. The elderly man wiped them away. Because they keep balance. Peace is a responsibility for every creature, and they're supposed to be used to defend that. The beasts were supposed to mediate for the world on my behalf, to maintain peace in it, to exercise authority, not as weapons of war, but as keepers of peace. But they've been abused and corrupted. Indra, my son, you were the first of my children to experience the curse of hatred, and now only you can set the world free. Every human and every beast. What do you say? Sasuke sniffled a little. I want to try. Hagonomo touched his forehead to his son's. Okay, then allow me to help you. With his staff, he began to sew the torn pieces of Sasuke back together to return him to his identity, who he was. When he was finished, he kissed Indra's forehead. Go, my son. Bring peace to the world. And in that moment, the Ten Tails Jinchuriki knelt down beside Naruto and placed his hand on his leg, offering healing chakra to undo the damage. He then made his way to Obito, where he too healed him. Finally, he sought out Nagato, who he could sense was nearby. Entering the cave, Nagato looked up at Sasuke with a sneer. Come to kill me at last. Sasuke, eyes full of concern for the crippled man, hovered across the air and came down to him, where he placed his hands upon him and began undoing the damage done to his body, healing his legs, removing the rods from his back, filling him out to a healthy weight, and finally healing his eyes, returning them to what they should have been at birth. Nagato looked down at himself and then back up at Sasuke. Why? Sasuke smiled. Because you wanted peace. I'm gonna let you have it now. He then used his Samsara of Heavenly Life technique to return Conan and Kushina back to life, as well as undo all the death in the village. He returned to the village where Obito saw Sasuke. Are you in control? He asked Sasuke. Sasuke nodded. 
Yes, and I'm going to do as I promised the nice old man. I'm going to bring peace the right way. He walked over to Obito and threw his mask to the side. Obito attempted to hide his face from everyone, but Sasuke pulled it to face him. When I first saw this face, you told me the world had hurt you, and I said I wanted to heal you. And now I will. He put his hand to his cheek to undo the scars, but Obito grabbed his hand to stop him. No, Sasuke. You already have. You've already healed me. My scars ran deeper than my skin. They were scars of the heart. Ones that would never close. But you and your love, your kindness, you showed me the feelings I thought I had lost. I love you, Sasuke, with all my heart. Sasuke smiled. Daddy, Mr. Nagato, if you both want to bring peace, then let's do it together. We'll stop the wars and teach people how to love. We'll remind them of what they forgot and we'll stop them from killing. And from there, the three of them would roam the world, attempting to heal and mend these scarred hearts that the world had made. As for Conan, with her new lease on life, she would spend it as if every day were her last. She would marry Yahiko and the two would live together in peace. Naruto would grow up and eventually replace Minato as Hokage. And from there, peace returned to the world. Eventually, when Sasuke had grown old and it was once again time to release the tailed beast, he would do the same as the Sage of Six Paths had once done, and reseal the ten tails into the moon, freeing all nine beasts. And finally, as he passed, Indra would be greeted by Ashura with a warm embrace. Having finally laid their squabbles aside, they would end the cycle that ensured that they would be reborn over and over again, finally ending the threat of the Rinnegan and the return of the ten tails for good. Of course, this didn't mean that war would never again threaten the world. Humans were humans, and they did what they did, and sometimes that meant war and killing. After all, it was human nature. Corruptible and often evil human nature. But there remained those in the world like Sasuke, those like Yahiko, like Naruto, Ashura, Indra, and Hagoromo. There remained those who sought peace, who would show the world love and continually hope and pray for peace across the world and a permanent end to all wars. And that is the end of our story. This one was such a fun ride. I enjoyed getting to tell three different stories at once, only for them all to intersect at the end. I really poured my heart and soul into this one. I hope you enjoyed it. If so, let me know in the comments and how much you did enjoy it, if you would have done anything differently, and what you wish to see in the future. Be sure to click that like button, subscribe, and ring the bell so YouTube can notify you when we release more content like this. Until next time, peace out.